Hi, for those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there is a sandbox where you can build your own plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. In this series, consisting of six videos, I showcase the development and content for the third big update for the game. When I started building the sapling, I knew I wanted evolution and thus random mutations to be a part of the game. To my disappointment, playtesting quickly showed that random mutations had no place in the scenarios. If you spend 10 minutes designing the perfect creature for a scenario, and then within 5 seconds it changes at random and fails because of that, that is really demotivating to players. I added a second game mode, the sandbox. This had the added benefit that I could give more artistic players full control on how their creatures looked. Still, the sandbox in my head always was an extra. Reviews for the game these days, however, paint a very different picture. As far as I can tell, most players regard the sandbox as the main way to play and the scenario is just an elaborate tutorial. I am totally fine with this, but this means it's time that I start to really treat the sandbox as the main way to play and add all functionality a true sandbox requires. Therefore, extending the sandbox will be one of the two main pillars for the next big update. I started work on this update by working my way through a long list of smallish features that I postponed so far, but I think are necessary to turn the sandbox into a full grown game mode, like a tool to place multiple body parts at once, an eraser, the option to manually change the chance for random mutations, and a notification log so you can look back what the game tried to tell you in the past. Another feature like this has actually already made it into the game, which is being able to select the duration of time jumps. So far, it was only possible to jump 300 years at once, but from the bug reports and Steam reviews it became clear to me that people were trying to replicate my 7 day livestream video by leaving their computers running for long periods of time, so they could see how their creatures would evolve for, say, a million years. A time skip button is of course a much more efficient way to reach the exact same goal, so I decided to do some sort of soft launch for this feature alone to give players an easier way to achieve what they wanted to get out of the game. Speaking of sandbox related bug reports, many 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 bugs related to random mutations have been fixed. You see, in the sandbox there is a class of bugs that I like to call impossible animals, which are animals that make the game glitch or crash, often because the procedural animation system can't figure out how they should move. I know these impossible animals exist because they show up as a result of random mutations, but very rarely. Whenever someone's game crashes, I can often find some hints in the crash log that the problem was probably some kind of impossible animal somewhere. But to be able to fix a bug, I need more than just this. I need to be able to reproduce the problem at will, otherwise I can never test whether my changes have any effect. So I really need to understand what animals exactly are impossible before I can fix the problem. Unfortunately, the amount of animals you can make in the game is near infinite, so there is no way to test each animal individually within my lifetime. As an example, animals that had two eyes on the side and then another single one on top but further back, like this bad boy, made the game crash until January of this year. Part of the solution to the impossible animal problem, surprisingly, turned out to be the 7 day livestream video that I mentioned before, because this video brought a massive influx of new players. Among them were a few incredibly helpful ones who managed to catch a number of these impossible animals in save files and then email them to me so I could actually see what they looked like and figure out why they were causing glitches. A special shout out to players Scully and Koda who both helped solve multiple major bugs this way. Something I also changed in consultation with players is the animal species naming system. The idea behind my original random naming system was to mimic simple English words like beetle, peacock or donkey. What I didn't realize back then is that once you turn on random mutations, you soon have hundreds of animal species. And if you have hundreds of names like Ransom, Merling and Zenru, whether it's simple or not, it all sounds like gibberish and most players ignore it. So I needed to give players something to hold on to. I studied all suggestions in detail and in the end I went with a system inspired by dinosaur naming, where at the end of a species name, like in Cosmoceratops, Bravoceratops and Pentaceratops, tells you that all of these are somehow related, or at least were thought to be related at one point in time. So when a new name needs to be generated, the system first decides at random whether it wants to keep using the ending of the parent species, which it will do in 60% of the cases. If not, it picks a new one from a list of nearly 300 Latin sounding options, like Tychus, Batis, Dalops and Lotor. 
and then one of nearly 200 simple starting syllables is added and we've got our new name. On top of that, it is now also possible to rename individual species if you have a special connection to one of them. Another good thing coming out of last year's attention spike was that I got a lot more feedback regarding the balancing of the game. Balance in an evolution simulation might not be as important as it is for, say, an online multiplayer game, but it is still way more important than I originally expected. In the 7 day livestream video, we saw that spikes on plants were quite overpowered, causing a major extinction event each time they emerged. Several people were so helpful to mention that camels can actually eat cacti, so I thought this was a nice opportunity to add a mouth inspired by camels and their close relatives from the camelidae family, like llamas and alpacas. It was incredibly hard to get this right though, because whatever mouth I created, it looked nothing like a camel or a llama. I studied many models created by people more talented than me on Sketchfab to figure out what was the missing ingredient to the look I wanted, which turned out to be a combination of a bit of hanging skin below the mouth and the tip of the mouth pointing downwards. But of course, I can't do a whole update focused on the sandbox mode without giving players more control over their actual sandbox, that is, the terrain. So far, there was just one sandbox level where I tried to include as much variety as possible, but of course, you can't have everything. For example, some players really wanted to explore the effect that islands have on ecosystems, and this wasn't really possible. So to give players a bit more control here, and also to satisfy my own geeky desire to build a procedural terrain generator, I decided this was the perfect opportunity to add one to the game. One absolute requirement that I had was that it should be possible to fold back the generated terrain into a sphere, so it can be presented to the player as if it is a planet. This does absolutely nothing gameplay wise, but I think it really helps to sell the idea that you are creating your own alien world. To get this to work, I created an object in Blender with two morph targets. One a flat plane, one a sphere, that the game can switch between on the fly. From here, it's only a matter of figuring out the terrain height for each vertex. For the sphere, a higher terrain means the vertex should be further away from the center. For the flat plane, a higher terrain means the vertex should simply move upwards. Here you can see me experimenting with moving up and down individual vertices in a plane by code. The big question of course is what the actual terrain height should be at each point. For this I use the most standard textbook thing you can do, which is to use randomly generated noise. You can visualize the noise in a picture like this, where more or less noise means brighter or darker pixels, but you can also apply it to a game terrain, where it means higher or lower terrain. My first attempt looked like this, which is already acceptable, except that it won't work in spherical form because the height at the edges doesn't line up. To fix this, I made it so that the effect of the noise algorithm gets weaker if you get closer to the edges. Okay, that works, but now you can see a clear seam. Apparently I don't want the noise weakening to be determined by the distance from the edge only, but I want the weakening to be really soft at the beginning and really strong close to the edge. To achieve this I used the smooth tap algorithm. That's better and let's also add an ocean. Next up is making the terrain a little more interesting by adding mountains. YouTuber Sebastian Lake taught me a great trick here, which is to use a second noise function to decide where the mountains will go, for example only where the pixels are super bright, and then a third, more detailed layer of noise to actually generate the shape of these mountains. Something you might notice about this terrain generated by noise is that it is always very smooth and gradual, there are no sharp edges of any kind. Another trick I learned from Lake is that you can make sharp edges by picking a height and then flip everything above that height. Or you can do that the other way around and have something more of a river valley. When folding this terrain back to make a sphere, you can see the effects are quite extreme. This feels a bit too cartoony for my taste, so I added an extra parameter where I can define the heights of the sphere separately. Finally, I added some clouds and a simple atmosphere, which is a shader that gets more transparent when pixels are further away from the center of the screen. For this shader again, I added a few input parameters so I can make it look exactly as I want. Fun fact, with more extreme parameters I get all kinds of super interesting side effects, for which I will probably never find a use within my career, but they're still cool. As always, integrating this back into the main game was quite a challenge. In particular because this was the first non-square map, so a lot of code related to where things go, like the statistics of the soil, had to be revised. The incorrect map did create an endless supply of interesting striped patterns though. This overall of the sandbox terrain also turned out to be a nice opportunity to add in a few terrain related optimizations. 
For example, the procedural animal walking system can be quite heavy at times because each time an animal puts a foot down, the terrain height for that specific point needs to be figured out, which is expensive. I've now replaced that with a system where the game pre-calculates the height on a few thousand points, which I've visualized here with white balls. Whenever the game needs to know the terrain height somewhere, it takes a few of these pre-calculated points nearby and takes the average of them. The weighted average to be precise, because the smaller the distance to such a pre-calculated point, the more influence this pre-calculated point will have on the end result. This technique is called inverse distance weighting. Another optimization stems from the fact that so far the terrain formed one giant object. That means that for every frame, the GPU has to worry about the terrain as a whole, even when you are looking at only a very small part of it. To fix this, the generated terrain is now automatically split into 32 chunks. It turned out to be pretty complicated to split up 3D objects on the fly, by the way. But now I've got that working, the GPU only renders the part that you are actually looking at and forgets about the rest. As you can imagine, this speeds up rendering the terrain significantly. So now we've got terrain that is not only procedurally generated based on player's input, but also a lot faster to render for the game engine. Together with the other additions discussed in this video, I feel this already brings the sandbox a lot closer to that full-blown game mode I am aiming for this update. But the fact that we now basically have a planet editor also opens up a lot of new doors in terms of functionality. Let's open these doors together in the remaining 5 devlogs. made you want to play the game you can. The game is available in early access on Steam and Itch. I aim to release the features presented in this video on the beta branch on August 16. If all works out as intended and I manage to fix the most annoying bugs, a full release will follow a month later on September 13.